welcome to the Bungie UK podcast. This is episode 10. You're greeted here by me, Davey. I'm Tony. I'm Alan. And I'm me. So we made it to double figures, guys. Oh my life. We could be really geeky and say it's episode 2 in binary. Okay. No, no, we're not going to do that. But what we will say is Simon brought us a celebration cake. Yay. Thanks, Simon. More cake. Yeah, photo on the website. What's coming up in the show today? We've got the competition results for giving away uh, another Canonical Store voucher. And we've got a new competition where we're going to uh, give away the efficient PC that we uh, reviewed on the last podcast. We're yeah. going to talk about how you can watch a video on Linux. We're going to talk about the great work that's going on uh, with the transcription of the podcast. We've also got a discussion on ignoring freedom aspect of selling Ubuntu. And we've got some feedback. And some news. Sounds like a fun-packed show. It is. We talked on a previous episode about using Myth TV to record and watch TV, specifically kind of Freeview or satellite. Broadcast. Yeah, broadcast TV over the, over the air. Um, but it seems to me that there's been a huge increase in online delivery of television programmes. Um, and that you can now get basically any television program legitimately from the broadcaster, at least here in the UK. Does that sound reasonable? Uh, some of them have services, yeah, that that make it available online, but it's not all available on Linux, unfortunately. Okay, some examples. I mean, the, the big one in the in the UK is the BBC, and then there's there's two other large, the largest uh, channels, ITV and uh, Channel Four. Yeah, and Channel Five actually have. With some of their stuff online as well. Okay. Yeah, but so, who watches stuff on Channel 5? CSI? Oh, I guess Neighbours is on there now. Oh, ah, yeah. well, there you go, you see. But all of these systems are DRM encumbered, aren't they? N- well, hmm. yes and no. Uh, the BBC iPlayer... Oh, the, one of the problems with the BBC iPlayer is it's actually multiple products branded as one thing. So there's, there's the version of iPlayer that is natively to run on Windows, and it uses uh, Contiki peer-to-peer software to share and download at the same time right and that uses it it runs on windows and it uses windows based drm uh digital rights management or if you're richard storman digital restrictions management just to stop you copying it and uploading it somewhere else but also so you can't watch after a certain date as well yeah 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 because they want you to only only watch it up to 30 days or something isn't it something like that no, I've completely ignored that as it's well. It's on Windows. So, so we have no idea, no concept. But the, that, that's one of their products. But there's a second one, which is the Flash Player. So if you've got a, a modern mm. version of Flash on your PC, Mac, or a Linux PC, you can go to their website, bbc.co.uk slash iPlayer, and you can just click play and you know watch a TV program in the Flash Player embedded in your browser. But you can, on Flash Player 9 and above, you can actually make it full screen, can't you? You can. I've, I've had kind of mixed um results with that sometimes it's um it plays full screen fine sometimes it plays a bit choppy and it's not it's not as smooth as watching a tv of course but you know your mileage may vary but then there's a third way if you've got an iphone an apple iphone one brand one model of mobile phone you can point that at the iplayer website and it will deliver um quick time movies and because the Apple iPhone doesn't have Flash built in. It doesn't use the Flash player. It uses uh, you, you actually get delivered a whole mob file that you can play on the iPhone, which is kind of annoying because they're delivering that content directly to one platform, the mm. iPhone, but not to anyone else because we can play mob files on Linux using a VLC or whatever media yeah. player. And um, the mob files presumably aren't <coughs> DRM. No, because isn't, the iPhone doesn't have any DRM in QuickTime. Isn't it actually MP4? I thought. Well, it's QuickTime. It's H.264 MP3 or AAC or whatever it is. Okay, so how does this impact us in the Linux world then? Well, the, the kind of annoying thing is the fact that they've deliberately made it hard mm. for us to get at that. You, they, when you visit the iPlayer website, it detects what type of browser you've got and what platform you're on and says, well, you're not an iPhone, therefore I'm not going to deliver mob files to you. I'm not going to let you download the mob files. You will only use the Flash Player. But if you've got a mobile phone and it... You know, it says I am an iPhone, then it will deliver the mob files. So they technically can deliver the mob files to us, but they choose not to. And that's kind of, I find that kind of irritating, especially they, as I'm a you know, I'm a licensed payer just like anyone else. Are they choosing not to? Or are they just trying to help the user to not have to go through the hassle of making a selection? They're just trying to do all the work themselves. No, they, they actually deliberately block it. They well, they've they've done some things to make sure that if you're using anything other than an iPhone you cannot get access to the mob files. Okay, okay. well, if you look at it this way, uh, 
if they can't actually present the content without any sort of DRM or any sort of protection, yeah, then that, that's the reason it's through the flash because you can't save it locally. Um, when you actually get a QuickTime file, you can save that locally using um, what we're going to talk about in a few moments, I suspect. Uh, but with the, as I understand it, the Apple iPhone can't actually save whilst it's watching it. So that is actually a, a DRM in itself, the fact that you can't actually save it to the device. So I can understand why they want to lock out other devices. I can understand. I can kind of understand why they do it. I, I, I totally understand that the whole reason is the content creators, the people who supply programs to the BBC, have agreements with the BBC that say you must not make this freely downloadable without any DRM. I can totally understand that. But it's just kind of annoying. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that you know, they do make it available for one specific proprietary platform, Windows, and they make it available for another specific proprietary platform, the iPhone, but not for anyone else. So you can actually get hold of these shows and download them as separate files under Linux if you use these clever scripts. Yeah, there's a there's a um, a few of them that popped up when the iPhone when the um, iPhone version of iPlayer first came out. Mm. A few people wrote some scripts in Perl, and there's one in written in Ruby, and there's another one written in PHP. Everyone's had you know, had a go at writing them, and basically what they do is pretend to be an iPhone. And they, they visit, the script visits the BBC page pretending to be an iPhone and acting like an iPhone so the BBC website delivers the content, delivers the mob file, and then the Linux-based script or whatever, the Perl or PHP, saves it locally so you can watch it at your leisure on the device of your choice. Now, actually, it's funny you also say that. There was another version as well written as a Myth TV plugin. Oh, right. So you could actually stream directly. Oh. Uh, but the actual developer for that didn't exactly get a warm response from the Myth TV core developers so he i think he's actually slowed down on the development what, when that. you say not warm response in what way well they told him that they would never get merged until it was approved by bbc right oh okay and did they did they do that because they were just worried about repercussions yeah. or did they had they actually had kind of notices about yeah do not do this i mean um uh, no no it was just that they're worried about it. the mid tv project is is very worried about um trying to protect itself uh, a few years ago, there was a plugin uh, for downloading torrents. It was a it was a torrent plugin. Now everyone knows you can use torrents legally, but that that was told that would never be a um, that 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 plugin would actually never get included. Uh, so he ceased development on that as well. But just because it's not in the base product, surely you know it's 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 not out of the realms of possibility that it could be a plugin or an add-on or something. Yeah, to be honest, um, myself and someone else actually thought about carrying it on. But it's fine that twenty fifth hour in the day. So, mm. so what other options are there for TV on Linux then? Um, There's a Zatu, isn't there? Zatu, yeah. Z a t t o o dot com. What does that do? It's a piece of software you download. It's a client that you download, and it's available for Windows, Mac, and there's a native Linux version. Okay. And um, when you uh, download it, you have to sign up with your uh, an email address and a postcode so they know geographically where you are. And when you open it up, it connects to their server and does some geolocation to figure out where you are in the world so that it can deliver TV channels to you that you're allowed, in inverted commas, to see in your region. So, for example, if I download Zatu Player and I register and then I sign in and I open up the Zatu Player, it gives me a list of TV channels, which are the standard ones you get in the UK, BBC One, Two, Three, mm. you know, that kind of stuff. And okay. you just watch it in a window on your PC. So it's just a live streaming kind of thing. It's not a, it's not a download it and save it and watch it later. No, it doesn't give any option for download. They've said that later on they'll probably implement uh, the ability to pause and maybe record later. But at the moment it just does live. In inverted commas, live. It's about one or two seconds behind. It's not far off hmm. uh, live TV. That, is that legal? Um, some people at the BBC would argue it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> they argue it is because they use some loophole in the law that says that it's okay for third parties to rebroadcast um, terrestrial TV um, because there's some loophole that allows other third parties like cable companies to retransmit, rebroadcast right. TV channels. And so they're, using, they're just using that loophole. Um, and I believe there has been some legal action taken by the BBC, but it's not actually resulted in anything as far as I'm aware. Okay, and I, you know, I pay my TV license, so you know, I'm happy to. You got a clear conscience. Well, hang on. Yeah. I mean, I, I pay my TV license, but does that mean I can go to my uh, local torrent site and download um, BBC the content that was on BBC? Well, the difference between the torrent and watching a stream 
is that with a torrent, you're sharing it with other people. It's not just a case of you downloading it for your own consumption, for which I can see there is an argument that morally it's okay that I can download a TV program that effectively I've paid for the creation of. But when you're using a torrent, you're not just downloading it, you're also uploading it to ah. people who possibly aren't in your jurisdiction and possibly haven't paid their TV but, license. But what I mean, isn't that their responsibility? If, if I upload something and I'm only uploading it to yourself and Tony, who are, or I assume are both TV license payers... Which is a theoretical scenario. <laughs> <laughs> then, yeah, but I mean, that, that, that's your responsibility to make sure you're not downloading it from me. Yeah, I mean, it's your, it's your moral compass and which way it points is up to you. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Simon, you a license payer? I am a license pair, but um, until when I said I don't use it, I don't watch broadcast TV at all. Um, what, nothing? Nope. I just don't watch TV. He's a secret yeah. Emmerdale watcher. <laughs> <laughs> no! He's got, he's got a PVR and he records every episode of Emmerdale. <laughs> he has it on a loop on his desktop wallpaper. <laughs> no, no broadcast. Um, but I do use, um, I use Miro or Miro. Depending on um, you the side of the room you set. Depending you, on who cares. <laughs> <laughs> I watch some of the video podcasts on that. And also use VLC to watch um, some of the stuff that's broadcast by um, by NASA TV. Does that just work? You just do yeah. you, Did you have to do anything to make it work? Or? Um, aptitude, install VLC, and watch NASA. <laughs> that's it. It just but, works. But you go to, what do you do? Go to the NASA website, no, yeah, yeah. nasa.gov or whatever it is. Yeah. And click, play. Click, play, go. Cool. It's, it's good that we've got these things that are uh, you know, open source and, and play this stuff back properly. Is the Zatu thing open source? No. And is the... Um, Miro, uh, Miro is. Miro is? Miro is, oh, okay, yeah. right. And the BBC things have Flash for, I, uh, for iPlayer, if you're on Linux. E, well, yes, that is an option, is to, to watch it on via Flash, yeah. So we're reliant on Flash? For that particular... And it doesn't work with Ganache, the it open has. source version. Oh, I was going to say that, because I was actually <laughs> speaking to one of the developers at... Rob, U, uh, Rob, Rob Savoy. Yes, yeah, uh, for Swift Deck. And he's actually oh. interested in actually working, uh, to get iPlayer working. So, uh, with so it, Ganache? Yeah, uh, right. No, with Swift Deck. Oh, that's the other guy. That's yeah. not Rob Savoy. Oh, yeah. sorry, what's Swift Deck? It's the Swift Deck, S-W-F-D-E-C. It's oh, the, uh, the right, other okay. Flash player, open right. source Flash player. Okay. But it doesn't work. So but essentially, you can't sit and watch TV on Linux without using some sort of proprietary software, um, unless you torrent. <laughs> yes, you you can if you've got a TV aerial. <laughs> oh, okay. use, yeah, Myth TV. Oh, so you could just yeah, using a, a, a tuner. Has yeah, anybody right. um, has anybody tried, anybody tried Banshee? Banshee One now has um, video support. Oh, okay, it does. It has. Um, it, it's got some. Uh, it supports video podcasts. Okay, and you can play back. You know, any kind of video. Now, everyone seems to be raving about Banshee. What, what's what's it all about? It does video podcasts, and it organises your music quite well, and it syncs with iPods. So, in effect, you could download video content from the web and then synchronise it to a video player like an iPod. So, you know, we've got a few options. Miro, Zatu, iPlayer. Or get a life and not watch TV. Like Simon. Like me. <laughs> yeah, but he sits and watches them doing their transmissions. Houston, we have a problem. Come in, please. Excuse I'm, me for being interesting. I'm going yeah, but to uh, hang on, the hang on. Now. To, be fair, to be fair, Simon must watch them because it must be like watching a race, you know, motor racing, <laughs> where you think, hang on, on this corner, they're going to crash, they're going to crash. And I guarantee that's the only reason he watches this race. You really want to know the reason? I'm a radio ham. All right, I'm <laughs> a amateur radio on the ISS. That's where it all comes from. That blew your theory out of the water, didn't it? Yeah, well, I don't know. I still think he wants to watch it go bang. I don't know. Fail. <laughs> Right, this is our tenth episode, and we've um, we've done some great stuff, and we've always been after feedback from the community and contribution. Yeah, but recently, in the last sort of month or so, it's come in uh, an unexpected form, I suppose, um, in that we're now um, transcribing all of the podcasts. We must be mental. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why we get other people to do it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean about the, the sort of the feedback. We're not actually doing it, although we sort of set it up. Um, members of the community are jumping in and uh, and transcribing the podcast, which is uh, fantastic news. Who's doing this? It all started when I listened to some podcast that was promoting how to um, promote your podcast. And um, one of the things he said was uh, get someone to create show notes, effective show notes and transcriptions. And then it just clicked 
that we should have transcriptions for a couple of reasons. And one of the reasons he mentioned was accessibility. But the main reason that this guy said you should do it is for Google juice, because all of this um, stuff that we're saying is not Googleable. Whereas if we have it transcribed and it's in text form, people can easily get to our website when they search for terms like whatever we've talked about this week or last week. So if we have a transcription that has the word Drobo in it, if we've talked about the Drobo thing over and over again, it will get a higher Google rating than just saying Drobo once in the show notes. No, well, not so much just the word Drobo. But it's, it's other things like we've, we've said the word Drobo and Ubuntu. And we yeah. said Drobo and Ubuntu and Resilience and Linux. And, you know, it's not just individual words that you've got in the show notes. It's like the whole combination of words. Because, you know, people search for wacky stuff. They don't just search for, you know, type Drobo. We're never going to get to the top of the list of people searching for the word Drobo. No, but we we would be more relevant because we've had a whole segment on it and we discussed it. We might be quite interesting to people who are looking for stuff on Drobo. So therefore, you know, because we've said Drobo a lot of times and it would appear... Even more in this episode. Yes. (laughs) And it would appear appear in the transcript a lot of times. Therefore, we would show up as a, in a Google result as being more relevant to somebody who is searching on. I'm on, not sure we would become term. more relevant. There's certain arguments that with words repeated on a page, Google actually knocks you downwards. No, right. In the in the search rankings, because if you, you know, like uh, a page that's got Viagra, Viagra, Viagra all over it, is yeah. going to go down the rankings rather than up. Yeah. So we should avoid the segment on Viagra then. Yeah, and should avoid saying Drobo, 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 <laughs> just for the transcribers. <laughs> no, that's really we- easy. Now, we actually had uh, requests before for transcriptions, but um, to be honest, a lot of work already goes into actually doing this podcast, and we didn't think we could really commit time ourselves. Not that it shows. <laughs> not, not that it shows. <laughs> um, so we, we, we thought, well, it's not really viable because we already spend so much time doing this. We're actually using version control where people can actually, um, they, could, they can work on their own computer, save it into a folder, and then commit what they've actually done into the Launchpad Bazaar branch. So, so I mean, what this actually means is that multiple people can work on the same piece, and um, so it distributes the work uh, around people who want to help. Um, so somebody could do one segment of the show, and somebody else could do another segment, and, bo- it, and both put it into the. Or uh, even less than that. I mean, all okay. it, uh, there's there's no, there's a number of steps. Uh, Dave found this um, software called Transcriber. Transcriber, yeah, yeah. cunning. Very <laughs> conveniently enough, it's it's quite old. And it's not it's not the most elegant software, but it works, and it works really, really well. And it's packaged in Ubuntu? Yep. And, you know, all you've got to do is open the audio file, and there's a little bit of admin you do, like, specify who the speakers are in that episode. And then you can just go through the episode, carving it up into lumps. And once you've carved it up into lumps, you can start typing um, the text as people are saying it. It's, it's really very easy to use. It is very simple. And the good thing is you can't mess it up. Um because you can roll it back because it's all version controlled. Well, you can, I mean, before you even put your version into the um, bizarre repository, you, you have a local copy, so you can monkey around with it locally as much as you like before you commit your version into, into sure. the system. So, yeah, yeah, you can, you can play around with it. And if you mess it up, you can undo that locally. Now, one of the really good things about this software is it actually saves in XML format, which is similar uh, sort of markup to HTML, I suppose you could say, where you've got a uh, uh, an opening and a closing for each part. Now, there was actually someone in the community by the name of Stephen O'Neill, and uh, he actually made a, a, t- a template that could help us convert the XML into HTML. So what this means is is that we don't actually have to uh, do very much to actually convert the native file that actually comes from Transcriber into HTML. So so what this means is is that people in the community have actually helped do the transcriptions uh, their work can be put onto the website very easily using this file that, that that's using this template that Stephen has has made. So well it done. It changes the look and feel, doesn't it? it makes it look like a page on our website. It's using the same theme. Isn't yeah. It? So that'll be at podcast dot ubuntu dash uk dot org slash transcriptions. Excellent. Okay. So why else are we doing this other than Google Juice? Well. There's a few reasons. Yeah, okay, there's the Google juice that you know we bring in, but there's also the fact that there are some people in the community who um, can't actually hear us. Uh, uh, who, well, lucky, I, lucky if people. I, if, I, if I try and get closer to the microphone, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> that'll help. I don't think that'll help in this case. Uh, we've got people in the community who want to be able to, for example, take part in our um, competitions, but they can't because they can't hear the show. Maybe if they've uh, got a hearing disability or... 
um, hearing difficulty or, you know, for whatever reason they can't uh, listen to the show, maybe they might be able to read it instead. Now, we also had uh, at least one person that actually said that they wanted to, uh, they were listening to our show, but we were sometimes talking too fast. So for people who where English isn't their native language, uh, they can actually listen to it and look at the transcriptions at the same time to actually see what we're saying. All right. So that that's another thing. <laughs> Are we making these up as we go along? These no, re- no, there, reasons for doing it. <laughs> no, there was that German guy, wasn't there? I can't remember his name. Yeah, he, he, who who uh, who made a comment. Actually, one of our very first episodes said that he uh, he couldn't understand us because we, we spoke too quickly and with a text version. In fact, if he were to load transcriber <laughs> he could listen to it and watch the cursor fly along the bottom of the screen and the little waveform going along the bottom of the screen in transcriber um and the text going down the screen at the same time so he can actually watch and listen you know read and listen at the same time so, like having subtitles so we're peeping to te- <laughs> we're peeping teacher english <laughs> <laughs> so how can people get involved if they want to help out i assume we're looking for people to help out yeah i mean we don't i don't think we need a massive team um for because you know we've only this is only our 10th podcast and we've actually already completely transcribed episode one excellent and there are people working on the other episodes right now and um and so you know yes it would be lovely if people could contribute and uh and join us there's a couple of things worth uh looking at on um launchpad we'll put a link in the show notes to launchpad there's a team you can join and uh, we send out mails to the team to let you know what's going on and if we're making any changes. But also there's a, a page on the wiki that details how you actually use the transcriber program and how you use Bazaar. Because one, one of the things when we talked about using revision control is that people, that might be a stumbling block, that might be a barrier to entry. People can't just edit a text file and send it to us. But I said that, that I think that's a good thing because I think trying to get people into using version control I think I think is is a worthwhile point. So if it's um, a, a reason where because not everyone can code, so not everyone can commit to a BZR branch, but everyone can transcribe. Therefore, they can learn to use version control. So I thought that was a, a worthy. Point. Yeah, it's a, it's a great way in for people to learn simple bazaar and um, and Launchpad as well. So there's a transcriptions team on Launchpad. Is is it yep. just for the Ubuntu UK podcast, or is it? for anything else at the moment in practice yes uh we've only got the ubuntu uk podcast in there but there's no reason why uh any other podcast or in fact any other audio product couldn't be transcribed in this method um and we've approached a couple of other podcasts and asked them if they want to have theirs transcribed and the idea behind this being our podcast only comes out once every two weeks and so in theory we'll have a bunch of people idle not doing any transcriptions once our back catalog of you know 10 episodes is done we'll have nothing for them to do until two weeks time when the next one comes out and there'll be a flurry of activity and then nothing to do and so in between that time in theory they could do other podcasts can we expand this if somebody decided that they wanted to do british sign language right now it's just audio could we use the launch pad system to do video how do you mean, Simon? Could we use Launchpad to do video? What you mean, have a person doing British Sign Language video? Yeah. I would say not, because trying to check things like that into a branch is going to be quite messy. I think there's better ways of doing it. Yeah, the revision control system doesn't work well with monstrous binary files. But you could, in theory, do do that. You could produce videos uh, using British Sign Language, using an interpreter like on the news, like BBC TV or whatever doing the podcast yeah there's no reason why we couldn't have an an og uh version of the podcast which was an og video mm. instead of an og audio and you watch it instead of listening I to it i wonder if there's actually any tools out there to actually uh generate a british sign language symbols from a text file i don't think there are but i think people have thought of that idea before and uh it's quite tricky to do because this, it, there are different languages they are different languages, but I think if people could get it working, it would be absolutely fantastic. Maybe we should get someone on who knows a bit about British Sign Language. <laughs> so where can people see these transcriptions? Um, right now, as we speak, uh, they're currently all still inside Launchpad, but Dave's working on a system that will grab the latest version of a completed episode and put it on the website with a style sheet that, that makes it look pretty. One of the other neat things about Launchpad is it makes it very easy to do translations. So we could potentially actually translate our written podcast into other languages cool. using the community. So if people 
who speak other languages other languages that's the word i was looking for <laughs> um they if they really wanted to hear our dribble they could they could read it in their own native language so that's uh, quite impressive actually the community uh, just jumping in deciding they're going to do something and, and getting on with it providing another product uh, another way of enjoying the podcast Ubuntu 804.1 has been released, incorporating all the fixes since 804, and that includes uh, Firefox 3 final release. So does that come with an SSL vulnerability? Nope. Oh, just a DNS vulnerability then. Ah. Best Buy are selling Ubuntu in their stores and online for $20. I can buy the CD for $20. Or for free from ShipIt. If you don't mind waiting. We would like to make a slight correction. Lug Radio, in their most recent episode, mentioned that the Premier Podcast was now ending. We're not. We're still going very strong. Thank you. One of the um, things that the Ubuntu UK Loco team is supposed to do is advocate the use of Ubuntu. Yep. Okay. Now... One of the big things that a lot of people use to advocate the use of Ubuntu and Linux in general and any other free software is the freedom aspect, the free and open source. Yep, sure. The big four freedoms. Yes, the free software. Well, not necessarily, because different people have different ideas of the but, freedom. But freedom with a capital F. Freedom with a capital F. Beard, yes. Stallman type freedom. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, and you're getting towards the point that I was going to make is some people find it quite difficult to get and it's quite often quite difficult to explain. Hmm. And I wondered how we could sell Ubuntu to people without using the freedom argument at all. So how, how, what could we say to people to convince them to use Ubuntu without talking about the freedom? Because right, the problem I, yeah, is that some people mean. just don't care. Yeah. It's like proprietary software, free software, who cares? It's just software. Is it good software or bad software? Hmm. Yeah, but, but the, hang on. The people who use Firefox on Windows or Mac or whatever that just like it because it's a good browser rather than because it's free software. Well, one of the first ones has got to be um, it's virus free. Now I know we covered malware and all the rest of it in a previous podcast, but that is one of the ways I sell Ubuntu to people that really don't care. So they they don't have to worry about viruses. Yeah, is that because you you perceive or you know that these people have experience of viruses? Yep, my sister is a prime example at a. PC loaded full of viruses and all sorts of good stuff. And I said, this disk will help and you won't have to pay for anything and it will just work. And that sold it. That's probably true at the moment, but... Yeah, how, the argument, how long we can keep that argument? Yeah. But I mean, it's good for now. Right now, it works. But then, you know, there are lots of Windows PCs that don't have any viruses. Yeah, I've, I've, I mean, I've had viruses on Windows PCs when I used to use Windows. I've had viruses on them. Not that I've been infected. I've had files that you know I happened to acquire from somewhere that had a virus in them, but I've never been infected. So I'm not sure that that argument would hold any sway with me, but that's because I'm, I don't know, I'm quite careful. I suppose if, if you're not careful and you're the sort of person who doesn't know that such a file that you download may have a virus, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're easily fooled into the sort of I love you virus scams or things like that, then having a system which is resilient to viruses may help. But, on, can we just back up a sec? Are you telling me you've honestly never had a virus? I've never been infected by one, no. Wow. I, okay. not, 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 not because, you know, I'm holier than thou and I, I'm, I practice safe computing or, <laughs> you know, in, in any way, you know, I, I don't do anything weird in the way that I use my computer. It's not like I, I have some kind of sandbox environment that I test everything out in. I don't do anything like weirdly, wackily, more secure than your average Joe. I'm just not an idiot when it comes to attachments in emails and downloading random executables and clicking on smileys in websites. I think that's really unfair, and I don't think you understand the average user. You're not an average I user. Know, I mean, I'm None not an average user, average and I users. know I've been infected by viruses before. So, you know, maybe I'm. I just no. I said. I said. I no. I said a combination of things. I'm not an idiot. Was one. <laughs> And another one was I don't click on attachments, like random attachments in emails, and I don't click on stupid smiley things in web browsers, which a lot of people do. 
Yeah, you're educated. We're all educated. Um, other people aren't. They don't understand the fact that clicking the smiley face could download a Trojan and infect their system. I, it's it's the you know the wonderful internet, and why would anybody want to do that? So maybe people don't understand that. I don't doubt that. But his question was, why have you never got a virus? Talking to me, yeah, fair and that was my yeah. point. I've never had a virus, but I yeah, my sister has. Yeah. Um, my sister's got three daughters who have infected her PC with all kinds of stuff. And I've had to personally go and wipe their machine and, you know, reinstall it and all that kind of stuff. So it's... when you did that, did you put Windows back on? Yep. Okay, well, that's an, another... Go on, ask me why. Thing. Ask me why. No, don't. <laughs> no, I don't need to. Oh, well, in fact, go on. No, why Why did you put Windows on? Because they want to play games. Okay, well, that's a, it's a fair one. Um, they, keep, they keep getting us on that one, don't they? Yes, they do. Well, the, the main reason that I've had to reinstall Windows, which I, I, I don't enjoy at all um, for people to use recreationally at home. Does anyone enjoy reinstalling Windows? <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the one of the main reasons that I, I have to do that uh, for family and friends and things such as that is because that's what they're used to at work. And so they're using one piece of software, one operating system at work, and then they go home and have to use a totally different one. That's one main one main reason. So that's the reason for people not to use Ubuntu at home. Yes, yeah. So how do we get over that? What other options well, are there? I, that's an argument I have a, a lot as well. If you use Ubuntu at home or Linux at home and Windows at work, in using both, you're actually understanding more about computing rather than just being a user. But do they care? Yeah, a lot of people, well, it's like a hammer. I just want it to hammer nails in. I don't care what, it, what it's made of or... I yeah, think if you, if you put it in the right context, they can understand. My wife's currently looking for a new job, and most people want experienced computer users. Well, she uses Ubuntu. So if she, somebody puts a, um, a Linux computer, sorry, a, P, a Windows computer in front of her, she it will initially be, be lost because it's unfamiliar. Whereas if you use both, you understand the philosophy behind right-clicking, getting a drop-down menu, um, left-clicking, um, and getting a sort of a standard set of things. You come to expect things to work in a certain way. And that does apply to Windows and Ubuntu at the same time. So do you think that they are similar enough that you can say, it's it's like Windows, give it a try and, and you know, you'll be able to use it? Or are there enough differences that you can't use that argument to sell Ubuntu? You know, the, the menus are on, on the top by default. Well, take a look at something like the, the Access EPC. That's running, you know, a lot of them, some of them are running Windows, but a lot of them are running Linux, and people seem to get on with those okay. And that does, and it looks a bit like Windows. I mean, it has got a Windowsy theme, but it doesn't look the like major, Windows. The major difference, I would say, between um, the E uh, methodology is it's actually supplied by a manufacturer like that. Now, if you go around to someone's house and say, try this operating system, when the computer came with Windows... They're not going to be. They're going to be less trusting of it when they actually buy the hardware with the operating system pre-installed. So, some someone like Efficient PC who sell computers that have got Ubuntu pre-installed, you think you'd have more luck with one of those because it comes with it out the box? I think so. It gives it an air of legitimacy mm. rather than you walking around there with a dodgy CD in your hand. With, with Ubuntu written on the front of it with a Sharpie. Yeah. yeah, is that why I'm you sitting for four you... hours trying to get everything working? Well, that's the other thing. That's the the winner with OEM installed stuff is um, it works. Like, yeah. you know, everything on this EPC works. I can play video. In fact, the only thing that doesn't work is um, QuickTime video, but everything else works. Like Flash, MP3s, I can get on the wireless. You know, none of that has any problem whatsoever, but it's not running Ubuntu. So is that, the, is that what we should be doing? Is getting, I mean, obviously we should be doing this, getting more hardware vendors to supply pre-installed working. I think so. I think that's probably being done, I would imagine. Hmm. By how many vendors? Well, I mean, it started with Dell some time ago, as we know. And then we've got the, the Ubuntu Mobile going on various little devices in this netbook remix and all that kind of malarkey. Mm. So you can get Ubuntu on PCs, but why should people choose it over choosing Windows XP or Vista? We'd, um, like, we'd like to think the cost element would be one argument, but that doesn't but do, seem to work. But it costs it? more to get it pre-installed on, from some vendors than the Windows version. Yeah, some vendors, yeah. Yeah, so that's that argument. Again, that doesn't work. All right, well, another way I sell it, and it kind of rolls out of the last one, is that if you have problems, it's easy for me to log in and fix it for you. 
Well, I can talk I to you know. over the phone and do it behind the scenes. Yeah, okay, you can SSH to it, sure. But, yep. I mean, uh, what's the difference between doing that and using VNC on Windows or remote desktop? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, this, this is one of the things. There's very few unique selling points that, that we can say, you know, we can do this on Ubuntu and you absolutely can't do that on Windows. One thing I can really actually push, I was on a sort of transfer on Windows computer during the week, actually, and I something which I just don't experience on Linux is Googling for drivers. That's something you really have to do on Windows, and it's not something I have to do very often on Linux. No, you on just Linux. have to Google how to configure the drivers on Linux. <laughs> <laughs> how to compile them. <laughs> well, no, I mean, ge- generally, it already put. comes with the kernel, whereas with Windows, yeah. you need to find all these... Um, to the, for the most part, that is true. Yeah. Out of the box, Linux supports more hardware than any other operating system. Yeah, a decent modern Linux distribution, like Ubuntu, should support pretty much all modern hardware. There's bound to be the odd sort of, you know, wireless driver or something that doesn't, but... But, that, but you're getting back to... Mind, it does work soon. Yeah. But then getting back to our original point of selling Ubuntu, the user doesn't care because when a user buys a PC that has Windows, it's pre-installed with all the drivers and it comes with the manufacturer's CD for the motherboard. So even if they do reinstall, it can be a bit hairy, but usually they've got all the drivers they need, usually, if they, it's a decent manufacturer. They would only care if it, the driver doesn't work. Yeah. If you install Ubuntu and something doesn't work, that's a black mark. If you install it and it all works, then yes, yeah, that's what's the same as Windows. Well, yeah. I, insta- well, I installed Windows on my laptop and it didn't find the sound card. So it, it's not it, it doesn't always all work. I was assuming that it was an OEM shipped oh, version okay. that yeah. was, Well, this yeah. was a OEM but, recovery CD and right. it didn't work, but yeah. Okay, so so the there are support options that are roughly equivalent to the Windows support options. There's virus issues that are, you know, manageable on Windows and, and Ubuntu. There's a cost issue which says that Ubuntu may or may not be cheaper than Windows. <laughs> it's um, not looking good, is it, Tony? No, it, well, it, actually, Ubuntu is cheaper because with a pre-installed Ubuntu machine, you get an Office package and you get a massive repository of extra software that you can download and install for nothing. That's true. So overall, over the life cycle of the computer, the software cost is definitely cheaper. The upfront cost of the operating system itself like you know, Linux and the basic graphical user interface is going to be you know similar between Windows and, and Ubuntu. I know it's free, but because of the way yeah. the OEMs sell it, it, it comes out much the same price. But in the long term, a Windows user is going to go out and buy you know Microsoft Office, Photoshop, and whatever other Mickey Mouse software they run. Or do they just download it illegally off the internet, don't they? It's very difficult to argue against that one. Hmm. Of course, they, um, they're going to have to upgrade the hardware as well. You know, Ubuntu and Linux will work on older hardware, which is got to be a good But thing. one of the problems with that argument is that people are uh, constantly now in the mindset that they have to upgrade their PC. I, I have a friend who had a PC, and it just got a little bit slow, not because it was broken, but because he got quite a bit of software on it. And I said, well, you know, just give Windows a reinstall because that's what you wanted to stay on Windows. I said, well, give Windows a reinstall. Nah, I think I'll go out and buy a new computer. And people are resigned to the fact that every two years they buy a new computer as if that's the right thing to do. And they don't think, well, actually, I could run, you know, Ubuntu on this older hardware. Okay, we've discussed quite a few points here. Now, I, th- I think we can split this into the freedom issues and the ethical reasons. And on the other side, we've got the pragmatic actual reasons. Um, now, we haven't really talked very much about the actual freedom issues. Now, I would actually be hard pushed to say anyone I know in the Linux community actually got into Linux because of the ethical reasons. It, that's, something, that's something that becomes secondary, I found. I did. Really? I did. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Couldn't stand the fact that everybody was ripping off Windows software. Don't buy it, get a crack version. That and, uh, and the geekiness were the two main drivers for going to Linux. Yeah, I, I think the geekiness reason for me, but I really didn't care about freedom. That's something that certainly came secondary. Davey doesn't care about freedom. No, it came (laughs) secondary. But, yeah, I mean, I'm with Simon. I read about Linux and read books on Linux before I'd actually got my hands on using it. And the idea of software which you could use, modify, uh, even if I don't have the technical skill to do it, that other people do and they can share it, was was what got me interested, which is one of the essential freedoms of of free software or open source software. But that goes back to my opening point, which was... Um, the vast majority of people don't care. You you are a very small minority, you yeah. two, that actually care about the freedom of the software on your computer. Most people just want it to work. You know, but I'm thinking that we've kind of discounted all the other things that people might say, or at least said that it's not clear. They're not a clear advantage. The remote administration, viruses, um, stability, maybe. 
you know, this idea, we've, we've kind of said that they're not all clear winners for Ubuntu. Mm. So it comes back for me, to me, to the freedom, to the fact that you've got this, this option and there are people out there working on this system to make it better and, and the community side of things as, as the major strong point and the major reason to use it. I mean, that argument certainly holds up with geeks. But when you look at your mother, your wife, are they really going to care about this stuff? No, my wife doesn't care. She doesn't give a, a monkey's what what the software license is. She just wants to be able to get on Facebook on her laptop. You know, doesn't care what the platform is. But there is the community out there, and and it is not just full of geeks. I mean, Mike from the forums was telling us how they get everybody from I've never used a computer before, through to you know hardcore coders or whatever. And so the community is made up of people who, who don't care about the freedoms or the ethical side of it, but they're still willing to kind of but still get, in the get involved in the community yeah. or with the community, at least in the Ubuntu community. Well, I mean, look at us. I mean, I, I've got machines that have got non-free software on. This, you know, my laptop I'm using here has got lots of non-free software. So I'm not a complete freedom zealot. And it's very difficult to be a freedom zealot. You know, you have to use something like Gubuntu or GNU Sense or something, and it restricts what software you can use due to, you know, those things aren't free. Hmm. So it's actually quite difficult to be a, you know, total freedom. And so even if I'm attracted by the the idea of free software, I still end up running non-free software as well. Hmm. So what other what other reasons we can use to sell Ubuntu? I don't know. Let's find out what our listeners think. Yeah, <laughs> get them to tell us what reasons there are to run Ubuntu. Yeah. How do you sell it? There've got to be some, surely. Uh, you can write into podcast at ubuntu-uk.org and uh, tell us what we've missed. Right, I wasn't here last podcast, but you had a nice competition. Um, a nice one, as opposed to nice a rubbish one. one. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't have a normal question this time, did we? Well, how did we do it? <laughs> Decided to make it a little bit harder, and possibly went a bit too far. <laughs> Well, we said we'd get wrong answers, and we did. We got lots of wrong answers. Well, we didn't get that many. We got we we get more answers when we do the trivia questions than we did for this. Go yeah. and look at the picture. Well, hang Is on. It, are we asking too much of people? Well, hang on. For those that haven't actually listened to the previous episode and actually, you know, just happened to listen to this one because they don't normally like us and they don't have us on our RSS feed and just don't care, um, we actually had a bitter. <laughs> <laughs> we actually had a lot of CDs in a field. And uh, the, the the point was was that people were meant to try and guess how many were there. It was sort of like a sweet in a jar uh, competition, wasn't it? Well, it wouldn't be very good if it was a sweet in a jar. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, okay, multiple sweets. <laughs> and um, well, I mean, how many entrants did we have totally? Twenty six, twenty eight, something yeah. like that. Like totally. <laughs> so I mean, the actual chance of <laughs> yeah. winning was, was was more improved than normal um, because there weren't that many entrants. And how many right well, no, there, we the, actually, I have to take issue with you there. The chance of winning isn't improved by the fact there are less people if you got it's the true. wrong answer. Fewer people. Well, no, to be fair, oh, to be God. fair, to be fair, <laughs> chaps, chaps, don't make me get my pain out. <laughs> if, Please, if, Daddy, if make we, it stop. <laughs> if we didn't have enough correct answers, yeah, oh, sorry, if we didn't have any correct answers, we would have given it to the nearest one. Yeah, we? that's yeah. true. So... And also, there weren't multiple people getting the correct answer. So, how yep. many correct answers did we get? We got one correct answer. Exactly one correct answer. Yeah, um, which was very good uh, work. We had quite a few that were in the right ballpark. Yeah. And so, if we hadn't had one correct answer, it would have been between you know quite a few quite a few people who were within kind of ten of the right answer. I'm not sure how people came up with the answer. That uh, you know, looking at the stack of the photos on the website, I'm not sure how people whether people just looked at it and went, yeah, roughly this many or. Whether people actually sat there and zoomed in on the picture and tried to count the pixels. Well, there know. was one chap that actually wanted to write a Python program, wasn't there? To actually count it for <laughs> he him. He wanted to use the Python image library to, yeah. to, to do it for him. And we did have at least one request for a higher resolution version oh, I had of the a few same of those. photo. I had a few of those on IRC. Yeah, which obviously we had to say no to. So what was the answer? The answer was 205, mm. believe it or not. And the winner was Gregory Auger. Well done. And we're going to send Gregory a... Um, uh, a token, <laughs> a crummy token for the fantastic canonical store. Yes, yeah, so it's twenty pounds. Isn't twenty it? pounds, and he can use it uh, anytime. It's it doesn't uh, expire, and uh, if he doesn't use it, or like if he buys a pen or something, and he has nineteen pounds left. He can keep that and use it on something else. And you can, of course, use it anywhere in the world. You don't have to be yep. in the UK to use it. Yep. It, I mean, it's it's in uh, British pounds, but obviously it will translate to whatever currency uh, you want to use. Yep, so well done, Gregory. And we're going to set another competition this time around, which is to... Are we? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Now, this is going to be a, a less rubbish one. Which is going to be for the efficient PC that we reviewed in the last episode, the Wraith. Yeah, the Wraith So we're PC. giving away a decent prize this time. We're giving away a whole computer. Hey, they're all decent wow. prizes. 
<laughs> but some are more decent than others. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're giving away a whole computer. You have to have your own monitor and keyboard, but the system unit is what we're going to give away. The question is, this is a shuttle PC supplied by Efficient PC, and it's configurable. It's called a Wraith, and we want to know what is the highest specification CPU you can get in this model of PC from Efficient PC. So you're going to need to go over to Efficient PC's website, find the Wraith model, dig out what the fastest CPU they have, the highest spe- p- CPU they have, and just email us with the answer. Simon, where would they send the email? They send the email to uh, competition at ubuntu-uk.org. And what email address should they not send the competition yeah, answers to? Don't send it to the podcast app, because or, or any that's other address. not the competition email address. So if you, um, if you send us the uh, right answer before the closing date of this competition, which is the 26th of July, uh, get your answers into that email address by then, and uh, we'll randomly select someone uh, of who's given us the right answer and uh, contact them and let them know how we're going to ship the PC to them. And uh, Good luck. we're not going to limit on where we ship it to, are we? Well, no. I don't know. I mean, if we, go, if we have to ship it to somewhere where we actually have to pay... Uh, some sort of ex-SAS person to go and take it out there in the middle of nowhere. I think we need to start talking, but I think anywhere <laughs> else we're not going to well, have a problem. You know, we've got to be inclusive, haven't we? Come on. Yeah, we're absolutely. Gonna, we're going to send it anywhere. Or yeah. space. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we've got a special courier who might take it up there for us if it has to go to space. Good luck, everybody. I think that's the end. Yeah, and before we wrap up, there's just time for some feedback. We had a couple of emails, one from Thomas Mashos and one from Wayne Hamilton, who both said really nice things about the podcast. So thanks for that, and thanks for the feedback, guys. Thanks, guys. We've had a member of the uh, community uh, come forward and tell us he's going to uh, do us a hard road review, so uh, expect to see that soon. Yeah, that's, we're going to record that at Lug Radio Live, I think. Yeah, that's exactly what we want people to do. If you've got a new bit of hardware, a new bit of kit you're using with Ubuntu, let us know. Maybe we could uh, talk to you about it, and you could uh, give us a review. And you had uh, some problems with your Drobo having sung its praises last time, Alan, didn't I'm you? I'm not entirely sure I sung its praises last week. Well, maybe I did. Yes, you did. Yeah, I did. I had a power cut at home. We've got the builders in at home and they cut the power. And uh, as a result, when I turned the Drobo back on, it kept rebooting itself and was not mountable and it went horribly wrong. Oh, but that's not too much of a problem because you can just take the disk out and stick it in any old PC and get the data off because it's all in an open standard format uh, file system, isn't it? Well, it's funny you should say that. No, it's not. It's a, oh, isn't it? No, it's a proprietary format. Oh, I, right. And if you take the disks out and put them in any other machine, they're completely unreadable. Wow, so you essentially kind of put your data in something that's un- untestable and you know, unsupportable and that only a small pe- number of people in the world can do anything about. Oh, uh, I had a support contract. I have a support contract. And I uh, contacted them, and they very kindly promptly responded within an hour, telling me to turn it off and then turn it back on again. Brilliant. Fixed it, though. Well, it it is fortunate that the redundancy isn't redundant in that instance. Yeah. (laughs) Unredundancy, redundancy. Right, don't forget, uh, we want to hear from you. You can get us in uh, a number of different ways. Uh, Find us on Twitter, twitter.com forward slash UPC. You can send us an email to podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. Or you can get in touch with us in our IRC channel, which is hash ubuntu-uk, which is on the Freenode network. Or there's our voicemail number, which is on our contact page on the website, where you can leave up to 30 seconds of voicemail. Thanks to all the mirrors, uh, showmedo.com, uh, Bitfolk. And we never thank ourselves, because we all host mirrors as well. And thank you, Dave. Thanks, Al. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks. Tony. Tony. Thanks. Yeah, that's it, Tony. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next time when we'll have some content from Lug Radio Life. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.